So welcome back to Beyond the Fundamentals. This is part two of the eight A's of salvation. In this one, we're going to deal with application, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, why we've picked that term. The first video we watched was on appropriation. It is very, very important if you want to understand this video that you watch the first one first. They are cumulative, and if you don't, un and if you don't hear everything that is said, including some of the disclaimers, then you are almost certain to misunderstand some of the things that we are saying. Because what I've done is I've taken a complex topic and I've divided it up into different segments, into eight different domains of thought or inquiry that serve as prompts whereby you can inquire about certain things. And what we're looking at is salvation. How does salvation work in different ages? Is it the same? Is it different? And if it's different, which it is, what are the differences? So those are the, that's what we're trying to answer here. I don't want to leave out saying thanks to all of our very faithful and generous uh, supporters. It's very humbling what you do, and you provide a great service to the people who really use this teaching. So thank you so much for what you do. The eight A's of salvation. And in the titles, you know, I've already gotten some feedback from the first video, and some of the feedback's good, and some of the feedback is predictably uh, people are hearing things that I'm not saying, and they're a little bit confused about some of the terminology. And I'm, I'm trying hard to offer plenty of copious explanation to alleviate some of the conclusion. So in the title, I have, I have the words dispensations and covenants in the title, and, and I'm struggling between two different opposing desires that I have. And one of them is I don't want to use the, lab, the phrases dispensations or covenant, like covenantal theology, because those phrases have a whole lot of baggage. And when you use them, people automatically think uh, like a whole truckload of things that you're not trying to say necessarily. But at the same time, if I don't use them, it's also difficult on the other hand to articulate the, the relevance of what I'm trying to say and the domain of thought to which these things apply. So in theology, there already is, there already exists domains of thoughts about either dispensational or covenantal theology. And so I'm including those so that you know that it applies to that type of thinking or that if you understood this, it, it would allow you to categorize things either for or against those. But I don't want you to think this is not for dispensationalism. It's not against dispensationalism. It's not for or against covenantal theology. It is designed, it, it's a fresh perspective, which I think is a necessary perspective. I think it's a good perspective. But I think it's a fresh perspective. I don't know of anybody else who's ever looked at these things the way we're looking at them here, which is good because, you, I mean, you can't exactly accuse me of getting this from my tradition. I didn't learn this from anybody, okay? So, so through the leadership of the Holy Spirit over the years, we're developing this specific approach to Scripture. It's not a system. It's not a set of doctrines. It's just domains of inquiry where we can ask certain things of the text. And I can identify with these labels the types of schools of thought that it will affect what, what we're going to get into. But I don't want those phrases, dispensationalism or covenantalism, that kind of thing, I don't want those to carry with them the baggage of those systems. Because frankly, I could care less about the systems or the people who are the proponents of those systems. I don't care. I don't care whether or not I do or don't align with any of those individuals. I really don't care. Okay? I also want to clear up something else. We went to Ephesians 3 last week, and I think somebody thought because the passage says dispensation of the grace of God, that a lot of people who call themselves dispensationalists, they use that passage to say, we're in the dispensation of grace right now. And then they cite that passage. And that's not good. I, I did a video five years ago on the background of the Apostle Paul where I, where I explained this very clearly that that phrase, the dispensation of the grace of God, that is just a circumstantial use of that word. It has nothing to do with a time period called the dispensation of grace. It has absolutely nothing to do with that at all. 
All that verse is saying in Ephesians 3, 2, the dispensation of the grace of God is that God dispensed grace to Paul for his specific ministry. You see, Paul has a very specific ministry where a mystery, a mystery was revealed to him and he received the grace to receive, understand, and then propagate that mystery back out to other people. So that is the dispensation of the grace of God to him. And in that video, I describe it like, like a soda dispenser, a dispensation of soda into a cup or a dispensation of water from a water dispenser into a cup or a bottle. That's the idea. God is a grace dispenser, gr dispensing grace out to Paul for his specific mission. Okay, Paul's saying pretty much the exact same thing, but worded differently over in Colossians 1.25. But over there, instead of saying dispensation of, of the grace of God, he says dispensation of God. We don't have a period of time called the dispensation of God, do we? <laughs> no, that's simply saying God dispensed something to Paul. Okay, the only time maybe dispensation could refer to a certain time period or an economy of how God administered his grace during a certain period of time or his actions toward mankind, maybe the dispensation of the fullness of times in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. But even then, um, I think that's this just the history having run its course and been dispensed. I think was what that's talking about. So you're not going to, you're not going to hear me find like take a passage that has the word dispensation in it and try to use it as a proof text for a system that bears the name dispensationalism that some people buy into. Okay. So whether, as we're going through these things, if something aligns with dispensationalism, fine. If it doesn't fine. I really don't care. What we're trying to do is understand the Bible better. And I'm trying to give you tools whereby you can research further and understand the Bible better. And on purpose, <laughs> I'm pur I am purposefully leaving some questions unanswered. For example, we talked about appropriation last time. And what we did clear up for sure is how we appropriate salvation Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That is, that is exactly and precisely how we appropriate salvation. But we identified for sure that before Christ showed up, nobody appropriated salvation that way. Nobody from Adam through John the Baptist appropriated salvation in accordance with Romans 10.9. Nobody. So then the question would be, well, how did they appropriate salvation? And my goal specifically and on purpose is not to provide you with that answer, but to point out that it is different. However, we do it is not how they did it, tracking. And then if you want to know how they did it, look it up, search it out. See, it's a domain of inquiry. So now I've given you a domain of thought, a category of thought. How do people appropriate salvation? And now you can search that out specifically. But bear in mind, as you look in the Old Testament, or the New Testament for that matter, just because somebody's being told to do something does not mean they are being told to do it to get saved. So bear that in mind. A lot of false doctrine out there now, it takes, it takes other commands in the New Testament, like for today, people who teach work salvation today, they confuse commands in the New Testament with commands in order to be saved. And they confuse those things. So don't make that mistake when you're going through and looking for, you know, what did XYZ person or people during XYZ time frame have to do to appropriate salvation? Ask that question. Do your research. But don't make the mistake of thinking everything they're told to do is what's required to be saved. Because it's not. So don't make that mistake. I'll say again, like I said last time, nobody is ever saved. Nobody ever earns their salvation by their own works. And nobody is ever saved no, the salvation of the soul apart from Christ. So for all the things, if you're, if you're going to pick up and re listen to these out of order or anything else, I have to clear that up. Nobody's going to be a saved apart from Christ. I have to stave off. You know, if you ever, if you ever do any public speaking, you especially on controversial things like matters of faith, okay? What you're going to find is that all the time, one of the most difficult things you can do is clearly articulate what you think is true. 
And no matter how clearly you think you've articulated it, there's always somebody out there who thinks they've heard something other than what you were trying to say. Maybe it's a failure in communication. Maybe it's the hearer was thinking something because of loaded terminology that wasn't intended to be said. And if you listen again, maybe you didn't hear what you thought you said. Okay, maybe I say something wrong. Somebody emailed me the other day and I apparently in one of my videos accidentally said that saved people from the Old Testament and the tribulation period go to the great white throne judgment, which is not what I intended to say in that video. I intended to say that people, not, not saints, but people from those time periods go to the great white throne judgment. But, but anyway, so it's possible that I can mess up and say wrong things. And I catch that all the time, especially in editing. Whenever you, whenever you hear a, sometimes you'll hear a break in the video or sometimes you'll hear like you'll just see a still picture and you just hear audio. That's when I'm having to correct something that, that went kind of wrong. All right. Sometimes I just say things that are wrong sometimes. So, so communicating the truth, it's a difficult thing and it, and it takes effort. And I'm trying to put forth the effort to do it. Okay. So I ask you to have a little bit of grace with me. Try to understand what I'm saying, even if I don't articulate it perfectly clear. If you can help me read between the lines. Maybe you can tell me how I could say something better. I don't know. I'm always looking for how to say something a little better than how I'm saying it, okay? Because not only do you, not only do I have to, or you too, we Christians, not only do we have to clearly articulate truth, but we also have to contend with people who have a lot of untruths that they have to unlearn. And when I use a word somebody else has a different definition for that word than the, than the definition I'm thinking of for that word. So the, it, it can be very confusing. So a lot of open dialogue, maybe seemingly endless discourse. We want, to clear we want to make things as clear as possible. So the challenge to clearly articulate, that's what the Logos is, by the way, a very clear articulation of truth amidst chaos. That's what, that's what Jesus Christ is the embodiment of. That's what every Christian should be striving to do. So very clearly, nobody is ever saved apart from Christ. We're never going to say that anybody's works ever saved them. Okay? But appropriation of salvation is going to be different. Now we're going to go into application. And as we look at application, we want to look at the eight A's again. Appropriation, application, accession, accessories, accessories, assembly, afterlife, amount of revelation, action. We've got a brief overview in the first video, so I'm not going to do it again here. Again, these are not doctrines or beliefs. They are prompts or reminders for observation questions to guide your investigation. They are domains of inquiry. That's what they are. They are categories of inquiry. We looked at appropriation. That is the means whereby the individual appropriates salvation or affiliation with salvific truth. And the classic passage for that in the New Testament is Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. That is how we appropriate salvation today. It is not how salvation was appropriated by anybody prior to Pentecost, for example. And what we're going to be talking about here is application. And now I have here, and this can be confusing too, <laughs> Because I'm going to do a video later, how and when components of salvation are applied to the individual, but uh, or or maybe a better question is what is applied to the individual. Now, in the future, I'm going to do a video on the components of salvation and what saves. And in those components of salvation, I'm going to be dealing also with the glorification aspect of salvation. In other words, the future of the believer. What does that? Okay, and what gets a person born again? What gets a person regenerated? What, what takes a person here on this earth from the point of being lost to, the, to being saved when you can't visibly see any difference in that person, okay? So that's, I, I am going to use components there a little differently than I'm using it here. Here, I'm really just focusing on the justification aspect of salvation and nothing else, okay? Because... Nobody we're talking about has been glorified yet. The only thing people can do so far is appropriate salvation and be justified and be saved in that sense, not the, not the end. So we could say how and when are the components of salvation or the things that save applied, or another question would be what, what is applied to the person to save them, or what is applied to the person that makes them justified? And that's what we want to deal with. And I'm not going to go through the rest of these. We can look at the first video. Remember, you take those eight things and you hash them out. You look from 
add them all the way to the future, and you ask during each time period, how are they saved? We know how we're saved today. How were they saved back then? How were they saved under the law? How were they saved before the law? How were Abraham's contemporaries saved? How were the other people who, were, who recognized Melchizedek as the high priest at the same time Abraham did? How, were those, how did they appropriate salvation? Or how, how, what of the eight domains that we have, what were they for them? Okay? And I'm, I'm trying to prompt you to ask these questions. I'm not trying to tell you what the answers are or try to in, imply that I even have the answers for some of the questions. But to, this helps us know what we don't know, which we also talked about in the first video. Remember, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman it needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is how to study the word of God. Rightly divide you, find the find where things change. You say things definitely change here. So mark that, and we're gonna once we identify all the changes, then we study the word of God and we compare the differences and we see what is different in the different time, historic time segments before and after those changes. That's how you study, that's how you rightly divide the word of truth. So that's what we're trying to do. I have the big picture of the Bible here, and we're going to draw some division lines where we know something changed, and we're going to ask these eight, do, eight domains of inquiry of each of these time periods. Okay, things were different before and after Adam sinned. So, you know, what is that difference exactly? Things were different before and after Noah. Things were different before and after Abraham. Things were different before and after Moses. Things were different before and after Jesus Christ, for sure. Things were different before and after the crucifixion and resurrection, and then again after Pentecost. And things are going to be different again after the harpazo of the church, after the catching away, the rapture, whatever you want to call it. So we, we identify these changes. We want to ask these questions so that we can settle the question. Are people saved we know how are people saved today, and when people were saved in the Old Testament or during different time periods, how does it compare to how we're saved today? What's the same and what is different? And these are our domains of inquiry. One of the biggest problems. Now you always hear me say that all of the Bible is for you, but not all of the Bible is to you. And our biggest example is. You know, if, if you thought the Bible was to you, you'd be, you'd be obeying instruction that's not to you. You'd be out building an ark. You'd be out trying to sacrifice your son. But, you know, anybody with a brain in their head can realize, well, that's to Noah. That's not to me. That's to Abraham. That's not to me. There, there's cases like that. So very commonly, people read the Bible as if it's to them. Now, there, now the reverse thing happens too. And here's the reverse thing. The reverse thing is that once Christians learn what's true today then they try to read that truth into the rest of Scripture, okay? So I believe in eternal security, but I do not believe in eternal security before Pentecost or after the rapture of the church because I don't see it there. So for me to take that, what I, what I find, the sealing of the Spirit to the day of redemption, you're sealed by the Spirit after you believe, Ephesians 1.13, and that has a certain duration of time till the day of redemption, well, before that, it wasn't happening. And after the day of redemption, we have no indication that that's going to be happening. In the Old Testament, under Moses, under the law of Moses, since Moses to, through John the Baptist, we don't see any indication that that's happening. Okay? We don't see regeneration happening, for example. And we'll get into that in the future domains when we look at the, the accessories and the accompaniment, things that accompany salvation. For the, for the believer today versus different time periods. But what we don't want to do is take salvation today and read it back into other time periods without... Now, people don't do this on purpose. They do it by mistake. They learn something that's true. Oh, this is how we get saved. And then you think that Adam did it, or you think that Noah did that too. And it's not that you very consciously think that. You, it's, it's an assumption that we don't know we're making. So I want you to realize that you might be making that assumption and we're going to identify our assumptions and then we're going to question our assumptions and we're going to keep them labeled as unvalidated assumptions until we can either substantiate them or unsubstantiate them. And then we cross them out and say, well, I, after all, I don't have any reason to believe that that was going on under the law. Okay, 
Calvinists make this big deal about regeneration. They bend over backwards and tie themselves in knots trying to make regeneration before faith. And it's very myopic of them, very short-sighted, coming with Augustine. He's trying to defeat Pelagius. He doesn't know his Bible well enough to do so. Pelagius tells him that, you know, if you believe you have to believe in order to be saved, then you and I both agree that you have to do something before you're saved. Well, that threw, that threw Augustine for a loop. He bought the Pelagian premise and then developed an entire system trying to avoid that. And what he should have done was reject the Pelagian premise. But Augustine was not a very bright guy, okay? So he did not reject the Pelagian premise. He built a system on the Pelagian premise. If anybody's, if anybody's Pelagian or semi-Pelagian, it is Calvinist above all, above anybody. They fell for that one hook, line, and sinker. So they bend themselves over in knots trying to prove that regeneration precedes faith. And the whole while, they don't realize that if you just pay attention to your Bible, you'd realize, you know, you think people were saved in the Old Testament, don't you? Yeah, they're saints. They're in the hall of faith. They're in Hebrews 11 for, for crying out loud. Then, you know, they weren't being regenerated. <laughs> so if you think that you can't have faith until you're regenerated, how about all those people in Hebrews 11? How'd they get faith when none of them were regenerated? None of them were. So it's just, it's so myopic and short-sighted. It's like, uh, you know, in the military, it's like, it's like a brand new lieutenant having great fantastical ideas and there's no mature person there to tell them um, to, to calm down and think things through first. There's, there, Calvinists don't have that. There's no, there's no adult element. There's no veteran or maturity element in theology to a Calvinist. It's just run rampant with the idea fairy and nobody to throw water on the fire. And it just goes crazy. And then they stick with the craziness and double down on it once you point out the error and the things they overlooked and the implications of the thinking process. And so we don't want to do that. because, And that creates problems. You think something, then you say it out loud, then somebody corrects you. And now you can do one of two things. You can either reevaluate from there and be like, well, I didn't think about that. It's a good point. Or you can double down and try to save face and then try to find an angle whereby this thing that you said or believed is true. And let me tell you something, and you need to understand this. You can make the assumption that anything is true. Anything is true. And then you can interpret the Bible as if that thing is true. And it doesn't matter what it is. You could say, all dogs are purple, right? Right? And then you can interpret the Bible, well, if all dogs are purple, then what does this passage mean? Okay? And you could do that with anything. Well, regeneration precedes faith. Well, if regeneration precedes faith, that means I have to find another way to explain 1 Corinthians one twenty one or Romans chapter 5, verse 2, or Titus chapter 3, verse 5. I have to explain those away to this other thing. You can do that with anything. You can start with anything and then decide to interpret the Bible as if this thing is true. And that's, that's exactly what Calvinism is. And that's what, sometimes you can do that with a true thing. And so that you, you, you run into fewer instances where you're corrected. Okay. So I get labeled as a dispensationalist. I disagree with dispensationalists. But if you start with dispensationalism, and you say, well, I'm going to interpret the Bible as if it's dispensationalism is true. You're making the same error that Calvinists are. All right. So we're not, we don't want to start, we don't care about dispensationalism. We don't care about that. We don't care about covenantal theology. We don't care about that. So we're not, we're not going to start with a system and say, if I interpret the Bible according with this system, then what do these verses mean? Which is, exact, that's all Calvinism is. And you can do that with anything. Almost a monkey could do it, okay? It, it doesn't take a great leap of intellect or inquiry or anything to be able to do that, okay? If faith, if faith is a work and you can't be, you can't have, then, how, then what do these verses mean? Well, obviously they mean something other than what they say. So it's not hard to do, all right? If, if Christ did not die for all, then how do I interpret these passages as a result? Well, you have to interpret them in some way that means Christ didn't die for all. 
and that's your a priori framework of interpretation, and then you force the Bible through that. So we're not we're trying to not start with an a priori framework of interpretation, but we do have what. So we have these eight domains of inquiry, and we don't have answers yet. So all I'm going to do is go ask the questions. What about appropriation? What about application? What can I find from this? So with application, what is applied to the sinner to justify them? And when is it applied? And how and why? What are the implications of that? Those are the questions we're going to ask. So we're not starting with doctrines. We're starting with things that we know we don't know. And then we're going to look to Scripture for answers. That's what we're going to do. Remember again, when I say the phrase church age, I'm referring to the period of time between Acts 2 and Revelation 4.1 or 1 Thessalonians 4.17. That's what I'm referring to as the church age. I don't want to say that every time, so don't get upset with me using conventional language to say that. Back in appropriation is a quick review. We learned that Romans 10, 9, and 10 is the classic way of appropriation during the church age. And we also know that before the church age, nobody was doing that specifically. Maybe Abraham received Christ in a figure. Well, we know Abraham received him in a figure is what Hebrews 11 says. And exactly what that means, I'm not exactly sure, but he didn't do that. He didn't receive, he didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, raised Jesus Christ of Nazareth from the dead. Okay. So we know those things are different. When it comes to application, let me ask this question. Sometimes a question can get the brain moving a little bit. The application of what, right? The application of what to a person's account justifies them in the eyes of God. Uh, is it the works of the law? Is it the sacraments of the church? By the way, churches don't have sacraments. There's a little hint there. No, no Christian church has any sacraments. Is it the righteousness of Christ? I bet some of you are voting for that one. Is it the blood of Christ? What about the Lord's Supper or communion, or the Eucharist? I hate the phrase Eucharist applied to the Lord's Supper. It does not belong there. Okay, it's two totally different things. You should never call the Lord's Supper element the Eucharist. All right, that's a pagan thing. Uh, is it, what about faith being counted for righteousness? Is that what's applied that justifies a person in the eyes of God? Now, I think there is some value in two of these. Probably some of you think number three is right. I'm with number four, a combination of number four and six. Because yes, faith is counted for righteousness, but faith in what? Okay, so you have to have an object of the faith in order for faith to matter. I can't stand those movies where people say, you know, you just have to have faith. Faith in what? You can have faith in the wrong thing, <laughs> If you, if you put faith in a broken down car to get you to work, you're not going to get there. But if you put faith in a car that works well to get you to work, you're going to get there. You have to put your faith in the right thing. So faith itself doesn't do anything for you. What makes all the difference is what the object of the faith is. Okay? So we're going to look at that. Now let's ask some questions. With these things in mind... How are these people, what is applied to these people? Now, these are all biblical characters, in case you don't know. What about Adam, Seth, Noah, Job, Abraham, Miriam? I don't know who that is. Jephthah, you know who that is? Samson, Zacharias, Anna, Samuel, Jonathan. What, what is applied to their account that justifies them in the eyes of God? And well, first, before you answer that question, you should probably answer the question, what is applied to our account that justifies us in the eyes of God? In this list, when it comes to viable candidates for what gets imputed to the individual, I see two things here that definitely stand out to me, and I bet most people, or many people, probably see three. So faith is, look at number six, faith is counted for righteousness, for sure, that's straight out of scripture. The blood of Christ, for sure, that's straight out of scripture, and I think a lot of people would probably pick the righteousness of Christ, there is this teaching, and, and I would be loath to pick that for a couple of reasons, but there is a pervasive teaching, and I have caught myself saying this many times, that the righteousness of Christ is what is imputed to the sinner. But it was called to my attention, I don't know, a while ago, that 
that we don't actually find that idea very strongly or very specifically in Scripture. And I know, I know what you're thinking. As soon as you hear me say that, you, you know, you're going to run to your Bible because you know to, f- to find the verses to prove the assumption. And that's first of all the exact opposite way of the way Bible <laughs> uh, Bible doctrine is supposed to be discovered and determined and taught. And I understand that, but when we look at the actual language that's found in Scripture, I, I don't, I, I recognize that teaching as an assumption, which, as far as I'm concerned, has yet to be substantiated. So when I look at terminology, like in Romans chapter four, verse five, but to him that worketh not, right? Who's the him there? That's the person that is not working. The works there in the context of Romans three is the works of the law. So to him that's not doing the works of the law, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, who's he that justifies the ungodly? Well, Jesus Christ, you know, died the just for the unjust. If so to him that doesn't do the works of the law, but believes on Jesus Christ, his faith is counted for righteousness. It does not say that he gets the righteousness of Christ imputed to him. So if we look at what is, look at this concept of imputed or counted, we know that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It never says that somebody else's righteousness was put on his account. His belief in God was counted to him for righteousness. I'm not trying to promote, you know, Calvinists is going to get a hold of that and they're going to say, you're, you're trying to exalt man above. No, I'm just trying to be specific. I'm just trying to be specific. And if, if you're constantly trying to use phrases to try to scare people away from the text of Scripture, what is it that you're trying to believe in the first place? <laughs> so, If God is sovereign, and He is, and if He is exalted, and He is, then first and foremost, He's not a liar. So we can trust what He says, right? So put aside all those little accusations about when we try to be specific about the text. We're not trying to put God down or exalt man or anything else. We're lifting God up by taking him at his word and not assuming that we have to believe something other than his word like Calvinists do. You see, to a Calvinist, if you believe certain things, that might, that might be putting God down or exalting man or it might be boasting or something like that. Therefore, you can't believe what the Bible says and you have to believe this other thing that men tell you to believe. Now, which one is more God-exalting? Believing what God says or believing what men tell you to say because you can't trust God's word? Now, it's just absolutely an absurd farce when Calvinists try that stuff. So don't let them try that stuff on you. But it's very clear in Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then in verse 6, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And how we just saw how he gets that what's counted for righteousness. The faith. That's verse 5. Verse 6 comes right after verse 5. Later on in Romans 4 and verse 11, Paul's talking about Abraham and he received the sign of circumcision, the sign of righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. Okay, where'd that come from? Why, why did he have the righteousness of the faith? And bear in mind, this is being used as an example for our faith and the righteousness that we get, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And what's the context? His faith is counted for righteousness. What's the context of Abraham? The seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised. So there's a righteousness of the faith. So it's counted. The faith is counted for righteousness. And then if you keep going on in Romans chapter 4, still talking about Abraham, Paul says in verse 20, And he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was also able to perform. Therefore it, it, was imputed to him for righteousness. What was? The faith, giving God the glory, and the full persuasion that God was able to do what he said he was going to do. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, what? The righteousness which is by faith. If we believe on him to raise up Jesus our Lord from the dead, and who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So I'm not taking a dogmatic stance that it's definitely not the righteousness of Christ which is imputed to us, but at the same time, I can't find any super strong language either. Now, the mind is immediately going to probably go to two places. And one is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he made him to be sin for us 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I've, without thinking, I've explained that as us trading our sin for Christ's righteousness, but it doesn't exactly say that. It says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Something happens to us as a result. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, here, here's the phrase, his righteousness. And this is, so we're getting warm to this assumption whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So the declaration of Christ's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Again, here's Christ's righteousness in action, but that's, it looks like it's dealing with a bundle of sins that were under the first covenant, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But the, but the concept is still, I'm not seeing a place where specifically the righteousness of Christ is what's imputed to the individual. Okay, so um, I'm only saying all that just to say that of these things that get imputed to the person, what, what is involved here? The blood of Christ is definitely involved, okay, set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, the blood is is one of the most important things in the concept of justification. It is the only thing that makes a redemption possible. The the blood is is the silver of the atonement. It is the it is the payment. It is the price. So it's the only thing that makes forgiveness and redemption possible in a New Testament sense for sure. And then we have the faith counted for righteousness as the number six thing. And then the righteousness of Christ issue. So the righteousness of Christ does play a role. It definitely plays a role. It's mentioned there in Romans 3.25. But is it the righteousness of Christ that's given to the individual that gets taught a lot? And it sounds heretical to say that that's not it, but that's not what the text says that I can find. It does say his faith is counted for righteousness. So something gets counted for righteousness. All right. I just want to call that to your attention. You can search that out on your own. I'm not going to be super dogmatic about it one way or another. All I'm trying to do is raise awareness so that we're a little more careful and precise and specific with how we talk about these things, just for the sake of specificity. So let's move on. Let me go to Romans 4, 5 first, okay? But to him that worketh not, now the works there in the context is the, ju- is the works of the law. Because remember, that's Romans 4. And Romans 3 comes right before Romans 4. I know that could be hard to figure out for some people, but it's very clear that the works in the context of Romans 3 are the works of the law, okay? But to him that worketh not. A Calvinist tries to make your faith a work so that you have to devise a way to get saved without faith. And that's why regeneration precedes faith. That's why none of the Calvinists, like sola, sola fide, only faith, No Calvinist believes in only faith. They believe in prior to faith or without faith. You're regenerated. Then you get faith as a result. Calvinists don't believe the five solas. They believe the five senas, the five withouts. I have a whole video on that one. But to him that worketh not, and that work there is the the works of the law, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Well, who justifies the ungodly? Jesus Christ does. Died the just for the unjust. So you don't keep the works of the law, but you do believe on Jesus Christ. His faith is counted for righteousness. What's counted for righteousness? Well, it says right there, the righteousness of Christ, right? That's not what it says. It says his faith is counted for righteousness. And then there's Romans 3.25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And we're going to look at this passage in a minute. Um, The sins that are past, people who think you can lose your salvation, they're looking for a phrase to help justify that. And to them, that means the sins in your past. That's not what it's talking about at all. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. But I take that phrase, faith in his blood... I take Romans 4, 5, believeth on him, and then I have the faith is counted for righteousness, okay? So faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the blood of Christ is what's key. 
And that is today what I believe is applied to a person's account that justifies them in the eyes of God uh, by faith, not the deeds of the law. By faith shall man be justified in his sight, not by the deeds of the law. Look at Romans 3.20, look at Romans 3.28 and see what they say. So I want, to, I want to compare two passages here and I want you to think I want you to think about Old Testament sacrifices and what was going on back then. I want you to think about what's going to be going on in the millennium after the church age. In Romans chapter 3, verse 24 through 25, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, that's a very key word, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. There's the redemption that is in Christ. There is the remission of sins that are past going on in those two words, redemption and remission. I want you to remember those two things because they are different. They are not the same. Today, you get remission and redemption at the same time because we have the blood of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it's not that way. So they're two separate concepts that practically, from our perspective, are practically inconsequential or uh, transparent to us. But if you back up in time, they become very important. So Hebrews 9, 15 through 18, this is a very key passage, and this applies to a whole bunch of doctrines in Scripture, especially when it comes to salvation, especially when it comes to rightly dividing the word of truth. So remember this, Hebrews 9, 15 through 18, and for this cause, he, that's Jesus Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, notice that word redemption again, of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of a necessity, of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither, is the, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. The first testament under the law of Moses was dedicated with the blood of bulls and goats and rams and sheep and lambs, stuff like that. The New Testament is dedicated by the blood of Jesus Christ, so by means of death. So, quiz question, pop quiz. When does the New Testament start? Does it start when Jesus shows up? Does it start when Jesus calls his disciples? Does it start... <laughs> all right. Uh, it's pretty obvious. The New Testament starts when the testator is dead. That's when it starts. So maybe on Wednesday night when Christ is being crucified and he says, it is finished. Maybe that's when the New Testament starts. Okay. Maybe, uh, he, he, Isaiah 53, he poured out his soul unto death. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Maybe his soul had to do some more dying in hell. And that was the means of the New Testament. But anyway, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I know your Bible says the New Testament, but you <laughs> Just like any story, it has to give you some background information. So the New Testament starts giving you the background information for how we actually got into the New Testament, the Testament part of the New Testament. So there, it is very clearly in Romans 9, not of effect until the death of the testator. So to make it very clear here, let's look at that phrase, redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. A lot of transgressions, that is breaking the law, sin, was happening under the law of Moses and before that, okay? And could the, could the blood of bulls and goats take away that sin? No, it couldn't. We'll look at that in a second. So that sin, not taken away, had to be redeemed. Now, it could be remitted. Now, what do you mean by remitted? Okay, so let's take a guy under the Mosaic law. Okay, I'm 800 years after Moses, and I'm, I'm an Israelite, and I can have my sins remitted, but the blood of bulls and, bulls and goats cannot take away my sin, and they cannot redeem my sin. Now, you can look at, you know, Kevin in the Old Testament, 
let's say I'm in, you know, the book of Second Kings or something like that. You look at Kevin in the book of Second Kings and you say, Kevin, your sins are remitted, but you see there's some problems, some differences. Kevin from Second Kings can't go to heaven to be with Christ because the sins aren't redeemed yet. You see? So they have to go somewhere else. It's called, it gets called different things like paradise and Abraham's bosom. And we'll talk more about that in the afterlife portion of these eight domains of inquiry. Okay, consider that. So I have a sin debt that has been taken off of my account. So I, I'm no longer responsible for it, but it still has to be paid. Imagine you gave somebody, imagine you gave somebody a loan. And then they have to pay it back and say, or say maybe they're renting your house or something. You're using their money to pay the mortgage on the house, okay? Let's say that one day they go, they have a hardship and they can't make the rent payment that month. And you decide to forgive that month's rent payment. But that doesn't change the fact that you still have to go back and change that. You still have to go back and pay that mortgage payment. Now that mortgage payment's coming out of your pocket. They're not held responsible for it anymore, but it still has to be paid. You understand that? And that's how sin is in the Old Testament. We, your sins are remitted. They're taken off of your responsibility, but they still have to be redeemed. And the, the message of Jesus Christ in the New Testament is that Jesus Christ is the only proper basis for the remission of sins in the Old Testament. So, in other words, Jesus has to redeem all the sins that were remitted in the Old Testament. He has to redeem them. And then we get forgiveness through his blood, Ephesians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. Forgiveness and redemption through his blood, and that phrase, through his blood, I think Colossians removes through his blood in the New Bibles, which makes the verse a lie, by the way which conflates these ideas without the blood of Christ. There's no, re there's no redemption. So that Old Testament, if you're sacrificing goats and bulls, uh, you're not going to get to heaven on that. If you're working, you're not going to get to heaven on that. What gets us to the Father, Jesus Christ? What gets them to the Father, Jesus Christ? Do they appropriate it like we did? No, absolutely not, but for sure. Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and resurrection is the only proper basis ever at any time for the remission of sins, for the redemption of the sins that had been remitted, okay? So if you have a bunch of remitted sins, somebody's got to come along and redeem those sins. And I have here written, Jesus is the only proper basis, only proper basis for the remission or redemption of the sins up under the first testament. Thus, animal sacrifices did not save anyone. Bear that in mind, because I'm going to say something in a few minutes. Actually, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to read it in the text, and you're going to think I'm a heretic for believing it. <laughs> uh, a few of you are, and that's going to be interesting. So animal sacrifices never saved anyone, never did. If they did, Jesus would not have had to sacrifice for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Or as Romans 3.25 says, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. So the people are already taken care of. They did what they were supposed to do. It's not held on their account anymore. But Christ's righteousness has to come through for the remission of the sins themselves. Remission of the sins that are past. So no one earned their salvation by works in the Old Testament, else Jesus would not have had to redeem the transgressions that were under the First Testament. So that should be very clear. Very, very clear. That from this we can, from this we can be absolutely conclusive that nobody, nobody is going to have their sins remitted without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So I don't want to. I may have said some things that could come across as confusing, but the but the sins get taken off the person's account. They're no no longer held culpable under the new test under the old testament, but those sins still have to be paid for. And if those sins never were paid for, uh, then those people would it, they'd have a problem. <laughs> they'd have a problem. And then later on, we're going to find out that Jesus Christ, when he went down into, uh, pulled out, poured out his soul as a transgression, that will not leave my soul in hell. 
that kind of thing. When he goes down there, he preaches to the spirits that are in prison. So the Old Testament saints are going down to Abraham's bosom, and we can talk about where that is later. And when Jesus Christ goes down there, he, once he has paid for their sins, once he has redeemed their sins, they are now free to come back up and he leads captivity captive and gives gifts unto men. So now on this slide, I've taken Romans 3, 24 through 25. We just looked at that on the last slide. We looked at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 18 on the last slide. So I've got both of those passages now far over on the left. Now I want to look at this phrase, for the remission of sins. You can see it in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, for the, mission, for the remission of sins. Now Romans 3, 25 says, for the remission of sins that are past. So we find out that those sins, the redemption, the, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, and then Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, those remitted sins have to be redeemed, okay? So when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, at the, at the Last Supper, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, and when you look at Romans 3 and Hebrews chapter 9, some people think it's shed, you know, this phrase for the remission of sins shows up several other times. But really the idea here is that because the remission of sins has been going on without a proper basis, Christ's blood is the proper basis for the remission of sins that's already been happening. From then on out, the, the sins will be redeemed. Okay, from then on out. So John the Baptist shows up and he says, John did, um, in Mark 1, 4, says John to baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Luke 3, 3, and he came to the country about Jordan preaching baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, um, in order to get into that, which I'm not going to do right now, you'd have to understand what's going on with Jewish baptism at the time. And at, at the time, the Jews had their own washings and things like that. But when a Gentile convert came to Judaism, one of the last things that they would do was get dunked in the water in, in the mikveh as their final ritual pur purification in accordance with the book of Leviticus. And that was supposed to you know, be the final remission, symbolize the washing away of their sins. It's a picture of it. Nobody, nobody thought their sins were getting washed away. And... To tell a Jew, basically, so when John the Baptist shows up and starts dunking Jews in the water, you have to understand that Jews were of the mindset that, hey, we, yeah, we have our own ritual purifications and we go through them on feast days and, you know, for other unclean items and stuff like that. But as far as needing to get dunked in the water to be right with God or for the remission of sins or anything, no, that's something Gentiles do. We're already Jews. We don't do that. So for John the Baptist to show up and start telling Jews, no, you need to go be dunked in the water. You, you need this ritual cleansing because you're a bunch of sins. That was radical. That was radical and that was crazy. And in order to do that, in order to go be dunked in the water, it was a very visible departure from belief in the e efficacy of the Jewish system to remit sins. This, si this system can no longer remit sins. So I'm going to come be dunked in water by this guy that is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. What's the proper basis of the remission of sins? It's not this old system that we're following. We're going to have to leave that and convert to something else. And it is this this Lord that John the Baptist is talking about. We're on his team. That's, that's what's going on there. So there's a lot of context there in the history that you can overlook if you try to take what people are doing in church today or teaching in church today and try to put it back on those phrases and those narratives without realizing what it is those people are having to go through at the time and what it means uh, for a Jew to undergo what is essentially a, a, a Gentile to Jew baptism. And now John the Baptist is trying is basically telling them to do like a reciprocal baptism, <laughs> recognizing the un un efficacy, the lack of e efficacy. He's trying to say that word fifteen times real fast. All right, and then Acts two thirty eight, Peter shows up and he says unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, Jesus Christ is the only proper basis for the remission of sins. The temple sacrifices are not a proper basis for the remission of sins. The, Jew, the Jewish system is not a proper basis. And the ceremonial washings, all that stuff, not a proper basis for the remission of sins. That's why it has to be in the name of Jesus Christ. And recognition that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and he is the only proper basis for the remission of sins. So when you take the doctrinal statements of Romans 3 and Hebrews 9, and you take that phrase, for the remission of sins, or for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, you understand Jesus Christ is the only proper basis for the remission of sins. And oddly enough, if you look at Peter preaches his next sermon, and the equivalent passage of Acts 2.38, the call to action, in other words, is in Acts 3.19, where he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I thought the sins were blotted out on the cross. <laughs> so, what is happening here? By the way, the sins are not blotted out on the cross. Just so you know, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us is blotted out on the cross. But you see, you have to have faith in his blood. So your sins can be blotted out to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Um, Israel, as a nation, and by the way, everything is Jewish-centric. Still, at that, When we get to the assembly portion of this, we'll talk about Jew, Gentile, the transition from the Jew to the Gentile, then back to the Jew. We'll talk about all that. But uh, I was about to say Abraham. Peter is still preaching to the nation of Israel here, where the nation in the future is going to have their sins blotted out nationally, even so all Israel shall be saved. Okay. So there is, there are some things going on here. I, I probably need to pause there and let you know that, um, I don't even like the phrase dis, or the word label dispensationalist. So I'm definitely not a mid acts dispensationalist and I'm definitely not a hyper dispensationalist. Okay. So because I'm pointing this out, some of you are probably thinking that, <laughs> So I'm, let me just stave that off right now. Not a hyper-dispensationist, not a mid ex dispensationist I'm okay with not even being a dispensationalist. I'm just trying to rightly divide the word of truth, whatever we call it, trying to rightly divide the word of truth. So I do want to point out there's this difference between remission there's a, and, and redemption, all right, and the sins, declaring his righteousness for the sins that are past. In the very next chapter of Hebrews, chapter 10, talking about the Old Testament sacrifices, it says, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. It doesn't say they're blotted out or anything like that. There's a remembrance of sins made again every year. Four, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. What's this remembrance? Does that sound familiar? When Jesus, you know, at the Last Supper, he says, this do ye in remembrance of me. It is possible to have a command to do something that is simply for the remembrance of something. Now, we do that as Christians, don't we? We do the Lord's Supper, and we do that in remembrance of Christ. That Lord's Supper is not a sacrifice. It doesn't do anything for anybody, except we are commanded to do it, and it helps us remember certain things. Remember Jesus uh, death and resurrection till he comes. But very clearly, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So, do Old Testament sacrifices take away sins? No. Is anybody saved by Old Testament sacrifices? No. Is anybody saved by their works in the Old Testament? No. Did they have to do works? Yes. What saved them? What, what is the basis of justification or redemption for the Old Testament saint? It could only be one thing, and that's the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins that were under the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. That is, and that's the only mechanism, that's the only proper basis for the redemption of anybody or the redemption of the transgressions anybody committed. That's the only basis there ever was or ever will be, and that can't be any clearer. So Old Testament saints were not saved by sacrifices. They were not saved by their works. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the only proper basis for anyone's salvation at any point in history or in the future. But appropriation, that is, what does a person do to appropriate salvation to themselves? Appropriation is what it is for us is not what it was for them. 
It's not the same during every period in history. So nobody under the law of Moses was doing Romans 10, 9, and 10. They were sacrificing animals. We're not sacrificing animals. Did those sacrificing animals save them? No. What did it do? It made a remembrance again for sins, and their sins are remitted or forgiven or taken off their account per se, but those sins still had to be redeemed and taken away, which only the blood of Jesus could do. So I hope we're clear on that. Very, very important. Now we're going to go into some stuff next that is not taught in a lot of churches. And when you start talking about this, people think you're crazy. And the reason is because they don't read their Bible, they don't get taught their Bible, and they don't think. That's why they think that. And so I promise you, if you read these passages and believe them, what we're about to look at next, and you start talking about this at church, you will, in very short order, be labeled as a heretic and probably be quickly asked to leave. Unless you go to a Bible-believing church, but they're just fewer and farther, you know, harder to find these days. But if, you, if you're like a typical Southern Baptist or something like this, they're going to they're gonna flip their lid. The pastor will have never heard of this, okay? I'm going to go to Ezekiel 45, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to find. Now, in case you don't know, in Ezekiel 45, we're talking about the future temple and the millennium and what's going on in the future temple and the millennium. This is after the church age, and the Jews are, are back in the program. Moreover, when you shall divide by lot the land for inheritance... now. <laughs> Right now, Israel has a little sliver of land. In the millennium, they're going to get all the land that was promised to to Abraham, which is all of Iraq and Jordan and Syria and Saudi Arabia and a good chunk of Egypt. Right, There's a lot of land. So that land is going to be divided in the millennium uh, among the Jews for their inheritance. And look what it says. Ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord. Keep going, Isaiah chapter 60, verse 7, also the millennium. Everything I'm reading to you is in the millennium. All the flocks of Keter shall be gathered together unto thee, and the rams of Nebaioth. What are we talking about? Flocks and rams. Very clearly, animals. Rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory forever. What am I saying? They're going to be sacrificing animals in the millennium. People get all upset. Oh, that's so crazy. Christ was the once and for all sacrifice. Of course he was. Now, you realize when you get all indignant and say that, what you're implying is that sacrifices in the Old Testament saved people. So what? why would Christ being the once and for all sacrifice change anything? You say, well, these sacrifices in the millennium don't save anybody. What are they doing them for? Well, the ones in the Old Testament didn't save anybody. What were they doing them for? You ever think about that? You didn't think about that, did you? People, people, we get called heretics because we point this out. We point out that in the millennium, things from the Mosaic law come back. And people get all upset because, you know, people have to sacrifice for their salvation again. No, they don't because they weren't sacrificing for their salvation the first time. What are the sacrifices for in Hebrews chapter 10? A remembrance is made of sins every year. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Did it save them? No. Is it going to save them in the future? No. Now, it's funny. The same people that get all upset, all upset about when, when you start mentioning the sacrifices in the millennium, in the future, after the church age, they get all upset. But it's the exact same people that try to say that we were saved the same in every age. Of all people, the covenantal theologists, who, like the Calvinists, who think people in the Old Testament were being regenerated before they had faith, you know, not of works, lest any man should boast. The, the Calvinists who think that should know above all people that sacrifices never saved anybody anyway. So why on earth would you get upset about there being sacrifices in the future when they're not going to save anybody either? What do you... Th- they didn't save anybody the first time. So, so it's kind of it's kind of bizarre the way people think. So if if you are upset that there are sacrifices in the millennium, what that means is that some part of you thinks that Old Testament sacrifices saved people. And when Christ showed up, that's why they went away. But it should be very clear. Old Testament sacrifices didn't take away any sins. Christ is the only proper basis for anybody's sins ever being taken away. 
And if they sacrifice animals in the future, for whatever reason they do that, Christ will still be the only reason for anybody's sins being taken away. So, we eat animals, don't we? We kill and eat animals all the time, unless you're a vegetarian or a vegan or something like that. Um, I heard recently that uh, Joe Rogan was on about, <laughs> I didn't actually see this episode, but I was just talking to somebody this evening who was talking about Joe Rogan uh, was talking about vegans who have cats and they won't eat meat or any kind of animal product, but they will feed it to their cats. I just think that's funny. Anyway, so most of us, we eat meat. It's in Genesis chapter nine, nothing wrong with eating meat. And so we're eating meat, right? go to the grocery store. Yeah, you don't kill the meat, most of you. Some of you go out and go hunting and stuff like that. Some of you butcher your own cows. That's great, okay? That's wonderful. But we kill animals and eat them. We also have ceremonies in church where we do this in remembrance of me, do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ, where we eat bread and we drink wine or grape juice or whatever you drink in remembrance of Jesus Christ. So what's the problem with killing an animal and doing that in remembrance of Jesus Christ. What's the problem with that? Does it save you? No. Would anybody during that time thinks it saved them? No. Is it okay to do something in remembrance? Yes, we already do something in remembrance. We already kill animals, we already eat them. So if we, if we happen, if the Lord's Supper becomes, becomes something and, and we're keeping the other seven feast days, where we're killing animals and eat them, eating them in remembrance of something or in observance of something, understanding that that's not the proper basis for taking away sins, it's not a problem. So get over it and stop flipping out about things that are very clearly in Scripture. See, the problem with things in Scripture, it's not hard to understand. <laughs> it's very clear. It's very clear what's going on. The problem is, the hard part is believing the text. And additionally, the hard part is believing the text in the face of ridicule from people you respect who are calling you all kinds of heretical things for believing what the text says. But if there's one thing that's very clear in the Bible, it's very clear. It couldn't be any clearer. When the Jews are restored into their land, the Mosaic law, or parts of it, are going to be restored as well. Along with that is going to come animal sacrifices back up. Christ is the once and for all sacrifice. Of course, of course. So we don't need to sacrifice animals to be saved, but they're going to be doing them probably for the same reason that we have the Lord's Supper today. Animal sacrifices never saved anyone to start with. So why would they save anybody in the future? They won't. But, what, but they'll do them. Now look at this. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 7, also talking about the millennial reign. And the sons of the stranger, who's the sons of the stranger? Those are Gentiles, okay? The strangers. You have the, you have the Jews and then the stranger in this context. Sometimes the strangers are Jews, depending on the context. Strangers that are scattered abroad, that kind of thing. But the strangers here are the Gentiles because it's Jewish-centric again. So the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve him, that would be their proselytizing to Judaism, just like they did in like Acts 2 and stuff like that, Jews and proselytes. So once again, during the millennium and during the tribulation period, Gentiles will be proselyting to Judaism, like a, like a type of Messianic Judaism, if you will. These strangers will be joining themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant. Yes, the Mosaic covenant is not fulfilled yet, and it will not be fulfilled until the Jews get all of the land and occupy all of the land that was promised to Abraham, and they keep the law in the land. That's the deal. That has always been the deal. And that deal is never going to go away until it is fulfilled. I am the Lord. I change not. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That is very clearly for the Jews that will happen. So the Jews are going to be doing that. The Gentiles who are going to be saved or doing the right thing are going to be joining themselves to the Lord. They're going to be joining themselves to God's people. And very clearly, look what they're going to be doing. They're going to be keeping the Sabbath 
We don't keep the Sabbath in the church age. They're going to be keeping the Sabbath in the millennium. And they're going to be following the covenant. And the covenant in that context is the Mosaic covenant. That sounds like heresy, doesn't it? (laughs) But it's Bible truth, and I love it. It's just amazing. It just refreshes my soul. And I don't care who's mad about it. Because I'd rather believe the Bible than any 400 traditional heretics who believe anything. Now, now I have to underst- you have to understand something. That people in my tradition that I grew up in, in Christianity, mostly Baptist, would think I'm a heretic for saying this. So I'm not getting this from anybody in my tradition. I'm not following anybody, any human, who taught this. I'm getting it right out of Isaiah 56. And with these strangers who have joined themselves to the Lord, who are keeping the Sabbath and who are upholding the covenant, taking hold of the covenant, proselytizing to Judaism, even them are proselytizing to the Mosaic covenant. You know, same thing. Same thing, different label. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, all right, Mount Zion, going to be the rest, and then the Temple Mount, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their, bor- their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And now some people say, well, you know, it's the, it's the sacrifice of praise. It's the, it's the incense of prayers and offerings that people try all kinds of ways to get around it. But I'm telling you, they're going to be sacrificing animals in the millennium. The temple is going to be there. It's going to be the temple from Ezekiel. And they're going to be sacrificing animals on the altar in the temple in the millennium. Coming soon to a Jerusalem near you. The people who don't like and the people whose cage that it rattles, they don't understand the application portion of salvation. What, what is it that's applied to the person that justifies them in the eyes of God? It is, and it only ever has been one thing, and that's the blood of Jesus. And the people who have a problem with there being sacrifices in the millennium must also be making the problem of thinking that the sacrifices in the Old Testament were doing something salvific too. They weren't. They weren't. Uh, Else Jesus would not have had to die and shed his blood for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Are, are we getting that? I, I hope you get that. In this new slide I've kept over here in Isaiah 56, the passage we just looked at, the sons of the stranger, okay, that Gentiles are going to be joining themselves to the no- Noahic covenant to join themselves to the Lord. They're not going to be appropriating salvation like exactly like in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Or I should further say, maybe I should clarify, that might not be the best way to say that. It might be that the actions of the faithful are not going to be what the actions of the faithful are today. Okay, and how they appropriate salvation may be another matter entirely. So we'll, we'll separate those two concepts. So Isaiah 44 verse 5, one shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand, unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. This is the process of of proselytizing, of becoming a proselyte to Judaism, surnaming yourself by the name of Israel. Take somebody who is not a Jew and you become a Jew. That's going to be happening during the millennium. And it's probably going to start during the tribulation period after the church is caught away. One of the main reasons the church is not going to go through the tribulation period, not not the main, but one, one of the primary reasons is that you have two different ecclesiologies going on at the same time. When we get to the assembly portion of, this, of these eight domains, we'll look at that. But during the tribulation period, you're going to have a temple. God's people are going to be sacrificing in the temple, and that's what the Antichrist is going to hijack. And there's going to be Gentiles who are joining themselves to those Jews who are sacrificing in the temple. And then uh, whenever the 144,000 kick in, people start becoming converts. All that is under and through a Jewish system. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in that other in the assembly domain that we're going to look like that we're going to look at 
But look at Revelation 7, 4. Uh, there's 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then in 7, 9, after this, I behold and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robes and had their hands. Uh, when, when it comes to all these different entities, the elders, the 24 elders, from what I can tell, and you know, Chuck Missler has some good teaching on this, but from what I can understand, the 24 elders in the throne room in Revelation 4 and 5 our representation are a representation of the church, right? They're already in heaven. The rapture's already happened. And then you have these, you have a group of Jews and you have a group of unknown people. So there's going to be a lot of Gentiles saved during the tribulation period. And they're not the church and they're not the bride of Christ. And they're probably not going to be sealed by the spirit to the day of redemption. And if any one of them take the mark of the beast, they're going to go to hell. Okay, so things are going to be different during that time. And they are going to be and I'll show you that in a second, but these are tribulation saints. One of the elders asks John, he says, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And John's like, why are you asking me, man? You've got, you know, you got the answer to this. So he says, and I said to him, sir, thou knowest. And the elder says, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So these are tribulation saints. People come out of the tribulation. Okay. Now look what's going on in the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which did what? Kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I know a lot of people are going to make the argument that, you know, the commandments of God are the commandments of Christ, like in the New Testament. It's just New Testament, New Testament Christians living the right way. But that's not it. The, the way that's used there, the commandments of God is especially juxtaposed with the command with the testimony of Jesus Christ there is people keeping the 10 it's people keeping the old testament law and have the faith of Jesus Christ the closest thing we have to it today is messianic Jews all right that's going to be the program something like that in the tribulation period so the church today which is not messianic Judaism it's the church it's different is not going you, you can't have that program in the tribulation and what we're doing today going together at the same time it would be confusion. Two different kinds of people of God at the same time. It's not going to happen. All right? We're definitely going to be gone before this happens. And this, is not, this video is not designed to delineate that or to try to teach or prove that, just pointing it out for the sake of understanding where we're coming from. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Again, that commandments of God is keeping the Old Testament law, the, the Ten Commandments. And by the way, the 613 mitzvah commandments, they, they are all category, they can be categorized under one of the Ten Commandments. Okay, well, I don't have time to get into that here. So while they're keeping the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus Christ, what is that gonna, what's going to happen there? We'll look at some more Old Testament passages for that. Jeremiah 33, 17 through 18. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Well, there came a time when there wasn't a man sitting on the throne of the house of Israel, but the point is there's going to be a descendant of David who's going to establish it forever, and that we know that that person is Jesus Christ. Neither, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man from before me uh, to, offer, to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And this is talking about the, the millennial reign. This is what's going to happen. They're going to do meat offerings. Not, not prayer and pray, sacrifice of praise. You know, we bring the sacrifice of praise. No, it's not meat offerings. All right, that's what's going to be happening during the millennium. Malachi 3, 2 through 4. But who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and shall purify the sons of Levi and purify them with gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old as, and as in former years. In the future, when Christ comes back, that's the second coming. Who may by the day of his coming. That's the second coming, the day of the Lord. And when he comes back, he's going to purify the sons of Levi. And what are they going to do? They're going to offer offerings unto the Lord. And they're not going to be sacrifices of praise and prayers. And th no, they're going to be meat offerings. Just like in the Old Testament. Are they going to save anybody? No. 
What's the only proper basis for the redemption of transgressions under the First Testament? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Is it ever going to be anything else? No, it's not. So are future sacrifices any different than past sacrifices? No. Did the past sacrifices save anybody? No. Are future sacrifices going to save anybody? No. Are we clear on that? Zechariah 14, 16 through 19, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, that's very important. When God deals with nations, you have to understand he's not dealing with individuals. Of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. That is the millennium. What they do at the feast of tabernacles, they sacrificed animals and Gentile nations. So at the, at the battle of Armageddon, all the different nations are going to be gathered together against Jerusalem, and they're going to lose because the Lord's going to wipe them out. And we're going to be with him wiping out those armies uh, that are going against Jerusalem. The saints of God are. Th those of us from the church age. Terrible is an army with banners. You can read about that in the Song of Solomon. You didn't know about that, did you? And so those nations that go against Jerusalem are going to have to go back to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what they're going to have to do. And I, that's... It's going to be such, uh, I mean, imagine, imagine the Saudi Arabian king and Jordan and Iran and Syria and Iraq and the Palestinians. They all have to come worship at the Jewish temple in Jerusalem every year. <laughs> that's, that's going to be great. It's going to be great. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth in Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up, he singles out Egypt here. Why would they not want to come up? You know, you got any Bibles from Egypt, by the way? You might want to look into that. Uh, so if any of the families of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague where, wherewith the Lord shall smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. During the millennium, they're going to be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles just like in the Old Testament. And the Gentiles are going to be forced to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's going to be enforced with famine and plagues <laughs> if they don't do it. So, there's that. Coming soon to a city near you. So you might want to pay attention to your nation's attitude toward Israel. And if you think that your nation is going to be one of those going up against Israel, maybe you should move to a different one so you don't have to put up with famine for the next thousand years. Maybe that's just something to think about. Or you could just get saved. That'd be a good thing to do too. So to wrap up application... During any time period, during any age, there is no appropriate means of redemption other than Jesus Christ. This does not mean that they were precisely aware of what Jesus would do. We know that they were not. They weren't Abraham and David. They weren't sitting there, hey, there's going to be a guy named Jesus of Nazareth who's going to be born in Bethlehem and he's going to die in 32 AD and rise again. They, they weren't thinking that precisely. Okay, They're going by the light that they had. But for those who are faithful, the shed blood of Jesus Christ was the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, okay? That were being remitted, not taken away, not redeemed, but remitted under the law of Moses. So it also does not mean that every other or any other aspect of salvation for them is necessarily in common with those of us in 2019 after Pentecost and before the catching away of 1 Thessalonians 4.17. So there are things that are in common with our salvation, but there are many things that are not in common with how our salvation works. That's very important to understand as well. So the application of Christ's blood is the only proper... And that's where the word application comes from. The application of Christ's blood is the only proper basis of justification and the only proper price for, for redemption and for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. No matter what's happening in the Old Testament, no matter what's going to happen in the future, no matter what happened, well, no, no matter what the faithful happen to be doing day to day to worship God at any particular time, Jesus Christ is the only proper base, basis for redemption that there ever was or ever will be, no matter what is expected of God's people at any given time. Now, I want that to be clear.
So we're gonna wrap the video up right here and, and I wanna do our call to sharing here. Uh, this information that we're putting out here is not very widely taught. And I have a belief, I know we do a lot of videos that deal specifically with Calvinism, but I have a belief that if people just learned the Bible, you wouldn't have to worry about Calvinism. You really wouldn't. Really, really the, the solution to Calvinism is not anti-Calvinism. The solution to Calvinism is the truth of the Bible. That's what it is. If you just learned the Bible, it would clear up a lot of false doctrine and it would inoculate you of the threat of any false doctrine coming your way. So think about when, when it comes to sharing this video, think about the people who need to hear this message or could use it or who maybe you would like to hear their opinion on what we've covered here. And I'll remember the main takeaways that we have, the application of the blood of Jesus is the only proper basis for redemption. That is the main thing that we want to take away for anybody at any time during any age or dispensation or whatever you want to call it. So that I can't make that any clearer. And I, I, want, I want to stress that. If you want to email me, email me. But please, please listen closely to what I've said. And don't put words in my mouth if you're going to email me. Okay? And our website is www.beyondthefundamentals.com. Probably won't have all these slides available until all these videos come out. I'm going to have one slide that come out that covers everything we covered in all these videos. All right. So thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you. And good day.